Okay, can anyone hear me now? No. Oh, whoop, whoop. Kathleen, <clears throat> Kathleen can hear me. The sound seems to be coming back. All right. Okay. Wonderful. All right. <clears throat> Let me just. Um, okay. Good. We have sound. All right. I honestly don't know what the problem was, ladies and gentlemen. Um, clearly, the uh, forces were aligned against us. Wonderful. We can hear. Let me. I'm not going to go through this whole um, introduction again. Let me just say that. Um, the Humanity Center is an institute for advanced study. We bring scholars to the center to uh, work on uh, books and history, literature, and philosophy, and that sort of thing. The important thing for you guys to remember is to go to americainclass.org. There you will get access to all of our resources. I want to point out that we have some related lessons uh, that uh, uh, will help illuminate the topic we're talking about tonight. You can find those lessons. Uh, on AmericanClass.org. And Kathleen says her microphone is off, so you shouldn't hear her yet, which is true. I have not turned her microphone on yet. Let me just get, <laughs> let me get through this introduction, and we'll get on with the seminar. Please check our Pinterest page. Please do the evaluations at the end of the seminar. Go back to that uh, Europeans Meet Con Native Americans page, and you'll find the evaluation there. Send that to us. We'll send you a letter certifying that you were here tonight and you can send that to your local certifying authority to get whatever credit your participation warrants and i explained how you participate you already know how to do that um <clears throat> i'm going to tell you that everything works better when you participate don't wait for us to answer a question uh, if you have questions or comments of your own make them give us feedback on the material just just send us anything you want I will bring it into the conversation at appropriate moments. I will interrupt Kathleen, who is prepared for my interruptions, and now let me introduce her. And I hope that uh, her, her microphone works better than mine apparently did. I'm going to unmute her. Okay, Kathleen, let me introduce Kathleen. She is a professor. Yes, we can hear you. I, I can hear you. I hope everyone else can. Kathleen is a professor of history at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She was a National Humanities Center fellow in 2008-9, and at the center she worked on Independence Lost, Lives on the Edge of the American Revolution, which was published just a few months ago, to really, really uh, solid, uh, praiseworthy, praising reviews. It, it, it's an important book, and uh, uh, we're very proud to have it uh, emerge from the Humanities Center. In 2009, she co-edited Interpreting a Continent, Voices from the Colonial America, edited with someone named John Duvall, who probably is a relative of Kathleen. He's family father. Up there, <laughs> her dad. <clears throat> and then in 2006, she wrote Native Ground, Indians and Colonists in the Heart of the Continent. So Kathleen, please tell us, what did Europeans think when they encountered those Native Americans here on, on these shores? It's all yours. Well, let's uh, let's get ourselves back to Europe before they come and think about what they expected to see, which will have a lot uh, to do with what they end up thinking they see. So I think I have. Um, so we're going to talk today about what makes some of the same things. Some many of you were in the first contacts one seminar, which dealt in many ways with how Native Americans saw Europeans. Now we're going to turn the tables, but as we found with the first seminar, we're going to learn a lot about both and have a lot to say about both of them. Um, so some of the questions are the same as last time. What makes a first contact? What generalizations can we make about first contacts? Why do first contacts matter? And then the last one is what interpretive difficulties do we face when we consider various European versions of first contacts? What do Europeans think they're going to see? What do they think they see? So let's start with Columbus. Um, in the late 1400s, as most of you know, Western Europe, Western Europeans were fighting and had been fighting for a long time the Islamic empires of North Africa and the Middle East. And one of the things that Europeans think about their Muslim enemies in the Middle East and North Africa is that they're successful because of the riches that they get from trade. That Middle East 
Middle Eastern merchants, uh, get gold and ivory from Africa, get silk and spices and jewels from Asia. And in order to get any of these things, Europeans have to buy them from the very people that they want to defeat the Islamic empires of the Middle East. So the idea, of course, is becomes in Western Europe to bypass those empires, to bypass those merchants and traders and, and trade directly with Africa and with, uh, with Asia. So the Portuguese go first, of course, and so they get to choose the most promising route, which is around the southern tip of Africa. Um, so the, the Portuguese sail around Africa and, of course, also too many ports in West Africa and Southern Africa to trade directly. So Christopher Columbus, coming out of Genoa, coming out of the Italian state, starts shopping around the idea of instead going west, going west around the world to reach Asia. So he shops this idea to the king of Portugal, who says, no, thanks, we've already got this, uh, this route around Africa, and then to Spain's monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella. Now, the standard story, of course, is that everybody else in Europe thought the world was flat, and Columbus knew better. He knew it was round. He knew you could go around the globe. Um, but that's really not right for the late 1400s. In fact, sailors and navigators and scientists of the day had pretty much come to a consensus that the world was round, the debate was over the math. How big was it? Columbus was on the side of people who actually thought the globe was fairly small. Columbus's math told him that there were 3,000, about 3,000 nautical miles between the western edge of Europe and the eastern edge of Asia. So if you sailed west from Europe to Asia, you could make it with 15th century technology and the amount of food and water that a 15th century ship could carry. Now, in fact, the distance from the western edge of Europe to the eastern edge of Asia is over 10,000 nautical miles. And some people, the people on the other side of the debate at the time, actually had that math pretty close to right. There was no way Columbus would ever have made it that far with the kind of technology that he had. But of course, there were a couple of continents in between. So not knowing that, Ferdinand and Isabella funded his voyage, um, and he sails west to the West Indies. So let's start with this first quotation that comes out of that letter that Columbus writes back, that you have among the readings, um, that he, he writes back to the monarchs uh, through their representative, San Antel, um, in 1493. So, uh, Kathleen, would you like me to read that? Yes, please. All of the people, men and women, go naked as the day they were born, although some women do cover themselves in a certain place with the leaf of a plant or some cotton material that they make for that purpose. They have neither iron nor steel nor any arms, nor are they warlike, <clears throat> nor not because they aren't well built and beautifully proportioned, but because they are wondrously timid. They carry no weapons, except that when they are planting, they attach a pointed stick to the end of a cane, and they do not even dare to use it, because many times I have put two or three of my men ashore at some town to speak with them, and countless of the inhabitants have come out, and at the sight of my men approaching, run away, not farther waiting uh, for his son. And not because anybody has done any harm to them, because at every point where I have landed and had occasion to speak with them, I have given to them of everything I had, fabric and many other things without getting anything in return, but because they are hopelessly timid. The truth is, though, after we reassured them and they lost their fears, they were so artless and so generous with what they owned, you wouldn't believe it without seeing. Anything they own, all you have to do is ask for it, and they never say no, but give themselves with it and show so much love that they would give their hearts, and whether they are waiting, uh, wanting something valuable or of little value, they are satisfied with any little thing you give them in exchange. So what kinds of things does Columbus point out here when he's describing these people, the Taino people of, of, uh, West, of Hispaniola? to the king and queen. We have a question on the table. What, what does Columbus notice? 
It's a little bit of close reading here. What does he notice? Naked as a jaybird, very shy and giving. Uh, oh, Amelia makes a good point. I think we're going to get to that. Uh, it sounds as if he's pointing out how easily they can be taken advantage of. They don't seem threatening to him. They're childlike. Columbus notices how vulnerable the people are. Timis, timid and Jane, generous, I can talk. Supplicants. He notices their weakness. He, he, uh, he does, but at this point, I mean, the tone of this letter is kind of, it has a kind of wondrous quality to it. At this point, he's definite, definitely taking advantage. I, um, uh, Kathleen, are we reading ahead a little bit here? Um, well, I think maybe we could point to a couple of things that he says. Um, so actually, maybe I'll go on to the next. I've pulled a few things out here. Um, and I think a lot of what people are saying is reflected here. They're mm -hmm. naked, <laughs> right, naked as the day they were born. Um, no arms, not warlike, wondrously timid, artless, generous, giving back what they had, like dumb beasts, he says at one point. Yeah, that's, that, 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 that dumb beast, that's sort of a giveaway there. Uh, dumb, dumb may just, just mean uh, um, you know, not quite yeah. stupid, but right. right. right, right. Um, so what, why, why is he expressing it this way? Okay, that's that. why do you think he's expressing it this way? Um, prospect of little resistance in the future. Yes, I, 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 our, our participants are reading this from the point of view of the 21st yeah. century here, pretty clear, and I think we'll see that in the upcoming slides. It's too bad Columbus didn't value these new people. A very, very perceptive comment. Yes, would that he right, have valued so, them? Yeah. Um, yeah, so let, let's go back to an island without danger for those who know how to govern it, right, Kelly? That's a really important point here, right? Um, he's trying to establish how the natives can be made useful, Ruth mm -hmm. says. That's so, so what... Okay, right, Amelia points out, he, he expects the Chinese, right? He expects these to be actual Indians, people of, of Asia. Um, so let's, let's try to fit. Why does he seem, as Amelia puts it, both awestruck and unimpressed? What, what are his motives here? That's a really wonderful way to put it, awestruck and unimpressed at once. Yes, what are his motives? Columbus and Europeans did view themselves as superior. Mm -hmm. That's right. And one thing I often point out to my students is that most early modern people thought they were superior to everybody else, including yeah. most, uh, most American Indians. And, um... They are not as civilized, in quotes, as the Spanish. Yeah, you know, this really is the encounter of, of, I know this is a cliche, the encounter of two worlds. I mean, Europe by this time <laughs> had a lot, of, a lot of history behind it. Uh, you know, this was a jaded, uh, sophisticated European encountering really, uh, what, what do we have here, Stone Age people, Kathleen? Uh, I'm not sure they're as different as, as we sometimes think they are. Um, I mean... One thing, Columbus was extremely religious. Sometimes we sort of flash forward him into a more secular age or an Enlightenment age, but he's not. He's an extremely religious man, um, and you know, in a in a medieval sort of way, um, late medieval sort of way. Now, and, Michael, make, excuse me, Michael makes a good point. He says he specifically mentions well disposed to the love and service of their highnesses. Given the earlier comments about how they were unarmed, it almost seems like he is saying. This is going to be easier than I thought. Why would why would he include? I mean, how, they don't know their highnesses from from anybody. So why would he include that line about they're well yeah, disposed so. to their highnesses? I think Chanel has it in the next line that maybe he's trying to secure funding for his next voyage to the West Indies, and I think that's ah, exactly right. Yeah, securing funding. Um, yeah, something I know well. <laughs> he wants to convince Ferdinand and Isabella he can get lots of resources from these people. Um, see that. Yeah, right, right. So let's see. The Pope had not declared these people human, so he not only saw them as lesser, but perhaps even as animals. It looks like the natives were attempting to be friendly, gave them things they, Columbus and his people, needed, gave back whatever the, they, the natives had. At the time, the view was if the natives didn't know God through the church, they believed the people to be almost like uh, barbaric. Columbus awkwardly judges them based upon his own provincial reference 
point. That's right. I think, and I think a key thing here, uh, sort of um, a little past halfway down, is no acquaintance with religious sects or idolatry, sects or idolatry, and I, but and yet believe that power and goodness is in the heavens, and so that's a hint that they are going to be um, convertible. They can become Christian. So, so that's a hint to me that he does believe they're human. They just haven't been introduced to Christianity yet. Um, mm -hmm. But they'll, but because he says they, they don't worship idols, they, there is no bad religion to get rid of. You could just introduce Christianity and they should. Well, embrace. that's a good point. Your last comment about there being no bad religion to get rid of. Michael Vernon raises a point here that, frankly, I, it never occurred to me to drop this into the context of the Islamic or the Moorish occupants, uh, occupation of, uh, of Spain. Could it have anything to do with the struggle Ferdinand and Isabella had with expelling the Moors from Grenada? Um, Absolutely, they yeah. view conquest here as less of a challenge. Could you could you talk about that for a moment? What is the That's, the context so, here back in Grenada? So 1492 is exact is the the year Columbus comes is exactly the same year that Ferdinand and Isabella finally kick um, the Moors out of Spain. So that last battle at Granada, and it's uh, and it's also the year that they expel the Jews from Spain. So mm -hmm. it's a uh, quite a year for the Spanish monarchy, um, but I think that's exactly Michael's exactly right that that Columbus is saying this isn't going to be that long struggle. This is going to bring the trade and the riches that we hope to get from Asia, right? What they think it is, um, and we're going to have easy, good relationships with these people who are simple, but have things we want. So it's dropped into that context, and the this looks like a like a, <clears throat> an easy conquest, perhaps. Right, right. So let's maybe. Um, and here's sort of his conclusion to the letter, if you want to read this, Richard. Okay. In conclusion, speaking only of this one voyage, which was just a rapid run, their highnesses can see that I will give them however much gold they need and with what little aid they give me now, spices and cotton as much as they call for, and as much as they order to be shipped to them of mastic and aloe, as much as they order to be shipped, and slaves as many as they order to be shipped from among those who worship idols. And I think I have found rhubarb and cinnamon, and I will find a thousand other significant things. Even though other people had spoken about these lands, it was all conjecture and nothing seen. Rather than understanding as long as people were hearing about them, most people were listening and making up their minds according to fable more than anything else. So I think here's, uh, here's Columbus's motivation. Right, yeah. It's, it, that's quite a list he's made there. Uh, Mastic is a kind of resin that's, that's quite useful in shipbuilding and things like that. Um, So I think this backs up many of the things we were already saying. That, and, and I think one of the things I try to get across to students is that, it, it, yes, we know that this is going to be an exploitative relationship, that disease is going to come, things that people have mentioned. Um, but Columbus, like most human beings, wants to think that, that this is a good thing. So he really does believe trade is going to, trade is going to go both ways um, and that these people will be brought to Christianity, which, of course, to him is the ultimate gift. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting that when he talks about slavery, as one of our participants mentioned here, uh, he puts in parentheses, from among those who worship idols. And it's interesting that in, the, in his original survey of the people, he didn't mention any idol worshippers. So right, he's exactly. sort of anticipating. Now, now he's just he's remembering gonna, there are idols. Right. Just, uh, he's going to find right. some people who are idol worshippers. So uh, is this is this a uh, that business about for those who worship idols that, that condones the taking of those people as slaves, right? Right, right. And this is a great. This is this is particularly useful with students because, as Ruth points out in her comment, he doesn't question whether slavery is okay or not. Slavery, in this world, in 1490s, is not something anybody is against 100 percent. Slavery is something they believe has always been with them, and that's true in North America and in Africa and in Europe. Um, but there are rules about who you can enslave and who you can't. And you're not supposed to enslave, certainly not supposed to enslave Christians at this point. Now the word slave comes from Slav, so they, they've, they've uh, Europeans have enslaved 
Europeans before, uh, Eastern Europeans, but they were, um, at least as Western Europeans considered them, they were not Christian. Um, so he's got to quickly say they're, you know, they're not only non-Christian, they're they are different, as Richard <laughs> reminds, from the people who are easily converted to Christianity. These are these are more hardened people, right? They, and they can be slaves. Mm -hmm. Now I can understand um, his his joy over discovering cinnamon, but rhubarb? I mean, really? <laughs> they went through all this trouble from rhubarb. <laughs> that really would be quite. A... Oh my God, gold um, smoke. <laughs> yeah, you know, we got rhubarb. Hey, okay, great. Now we have we have a participant asking, wasn't Columbus a millennialist? Yes, some of his religious writings are. Um, I mean, he yes, he was definitely a millennialist and, and millennialist, and he was very concerned about the coming of the end of the world, and um, just you could get very deeply drawn into Columbus's writings on religion, which are things people don't read very often. They, you know, this is they, they think of him as an explorer and a conquistador, but he was also a religious thinker and writer, um, and and. You, yeah, you will not think of him as a modern person if you start to read some of his uh, um, his religious writings, which are very much based in his time. Mm -hmm. And I like Michael Vernon makes a good point here. This really sounds like a getting in on the ground floor sales pitch. It's interesting how Columbus is telling the crown what he can do for them that other explorers can't. <laughs> in a way, this seems like a, a, um, a, a, a funding proposal, you know. Yes, and I he's know. also needling them a little bit, you know. When he says here... Uh, um, I will. Oh, let's see. When he's uh, uh, with, with what little aid they give me now. What I little would... aid you've given me. <clears throat> I'm going to give you all this stuff back, even though you've you know just a little aid with a little more. Good Lord, to get all the rhubarb you can possibly eat. <laughs> and yes. it works. <laughs> all the yeah, it rhubarb works. you can eat. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so baths of aloe for the plague. That's why aloe and that sort of oh, skin good. lotion right. is so important. Right, right. Um, and aloe, but we have here a person commenting, aloe is so easy to grow. He's very excited about that, too. And uh, Mary notes that he sounds like a bit of a sleazy car salesman. <laughs> he's just he's teasing people, Alini writes, uh, tantalizing them with the rhubarb. So now you can tell your students, folks, that the New World was colonized over rhubarb. Over rhubarb. Okay. Oh. There you go. Well, <laughs> I, and it's at about this point where I ask the students, oh, oh, now wait, wait. What language were Columbus and the Tainos speaking in? And they pause for a second. They don't know the same languages. So all these things he said, they've said, are without a translator, right? He doesn't know. Oh, yeah. There's very little chance he actually knows what they're saying. Um, so there will be many uh, miscommunications to come. In this well, event. that takes us back to one of the early questions in the seminar about the interpretive challenges in dealing with these documents. Right, right, yeah. So I think in this, you know, we can use this, and we've used it before. You know, people use it all the time to try to figure out some things about the Tainos and things that the Tainos were trying to tell Columbus, and I think they are trying to trade with him. But it's much easier and more obvious to see the things that Columbus already thinks, like what he's mm -hmm. brought, the expectations he's brought with him, and the audience he's speaking to, what he's trying to do for the future. Um, for one thing, he says that they'll never fight back, whatever the, the quotation from a slide ago about how they'll never fight back, they're easy to govern. He leaves a few men there, and they get killed. The Tainos kill them. So there's, they're not quite as peaceful and timid as Columbus uh, either thinks or um, at least is saying they are. That's a good point. So I, our participants should remember that audience and expectations shape Columbus's reports. Okay. Any other comments? Here we have the language question is a great thing um, to point out in class. Makes you reconsider everything Columbus has said so far. Jennifer writes, he does say, that with little aid they give me now sounds like he's saying that even though they are barely helping him financially, he can give them a ton of resources in return. Yes, he's yeah. a good fundraiser. Yes, that's right. <clears throat> so we well, have one more yeah. okay. comment coming in. Let's see what that is, and then we shall move on. Yes, he's so humble. He is. <laughs> well, <laughs> That is, you know, uh, that's that's uh, that's true. He, he's got to present himself as uh, somebody who can really deliver the goods. So shall we move on, Kathleen?
Uh, sure. Let's. Uh, so um, we're gonna move on to another first-ish encounter. Um, now, of course, other Europeans weren't that happy about the Spanish uh, going west. First of all, the Portuguese complained to the Pope, and uh, um, the Pope ruled in the Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494 that basically the Americas would belong to Spain and Africa would belong to Portugal. Um, now, the French and English then, of course, weren't happy about that. They didn't think that was fair. Both of them were Catholic in 1494. So France hired its own Italian navigator, Giovanni da Ver Verrazzano, who in 1524 sailed across the Atlantic to the Carolinas and up the coast to Maine. And then 10 years later, the French sent Jacques Cartier, who was actually French, not uh, from one of the Italian states. And Cartier made three voyages between 1534 and 1541 up the St. Lawrence River. Now, the document we have for this, uh, for this seminar is actually from his second voyage. So the first thing we'll look at is a first encounter, but then the other one is a, a sort of second encounter with some people he's already gotten to know a little bit. This uh, compilation comes from, it's a compilation that probably one of the men who was with him made, but made it out of Cartier's journal that he kept along the trip and also other people's reminiscences of the trip. And, but it also is addressed like Columbus's letter to a king, so in this case, of course, the French king. Um, but it's a much longer report rather than just a letter. So we'll start here at a village on the St. Saint Lawrence River, um, Hochilaga. And the people that we'll encounter here, the Hochilaga and then the Staticonas, um, both, you can sort of see them on that map there. Hochilaga is where Montreal is today, up the St. Lawrence River. Um, and Staticona is basically where Quebec is today, so, so a little closer to the mouth of the river. They were both Iroquoian peoples, but not members of the Iroquois Confederacy. And that information is quite important to understanding their politics, the sort of politics that Jacques Cartier enters into in the 1530s. They, uh, their opposed to the Iroquois Confederacy and beginning to be drawn into war against the Iroquois Confederacy, as we'll see. So let's go to an excerpt from the Cartier document that was in your packet. Okay. As we drew near to their village, great numbers of the inhabitants came out to meet us and gave us a hearty welcome, according to the custom of the country. And we were led by our guides and those who were conducting us into the middle of the village, where there was an open square between the houses, about a stone's throw or thereabouts in width each way. They signaled to us that we should come to a halt here, which we did. And at once, all the girls and women of the village, some of whom had children in their arms, <coughs> crowded about us, rubbing our faces, arms, and other parts of the upper portions of our bodies, which they could touch, weeping for joy at the sight of us and giving us the best welcome they could. They made signs to us also to be good enough to put our hands on their babies. After this, the men made the women retire and themselves sat down upon the ground round about us, as if we had been going to perform a miracle play. And at once, several of the women came back, each with a four-cornered mat woven like tapestry, and these they spread on the ground in the middle of the square and made us place ourselves upon them. When this had been done, the ruler and chief of this country, whom in their language they call Aguahana, was carried in, seated on a large deerskin by nine or ten men, who came and set him down upon mats near the captain, making signs to us that this was their ruler and leader. Okay, and the captain referred to there in the last line is Cartier. So, if you read this from the, this this version of what happened, what do you think the people here, the people of Hochelaga, are trying to convey to Cartier? What are they trying to tell him to show him? get him to do. And we have a question. What are these folks trying to convey to Jacques Cartier when he visits their village? <clears throat> they seem to be welcoming him. It's uh, He's like a, almost like a presidential candidate. Women are presenting him their babies for him to kiss. Uh, okay, let's see. We've got multiple attendees are typing. Let's see what we get here in the chat. What do you think they're trying to signal? They're welcome. They're positive. They're, right. 
not afraid, but in awe or devotion. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And let's see, trying to make a connection. While, while our participants look at these amazing godlike creatures, that, that's really an interesting comment, godlike creatures. Uh, last week, when we talked about the arrival of uh, Cortez in Mexico, the Aztecs did think he was a god coming back. And we don't see any of that here. I mean, I mean, it was quite explicit that they, they thought this was, what, Quetzalcoatl coming back. Did, um, is there any indication that the northern tribes thought the Europeans were gods and before we get to that let's see uh shows why the french did a bit better than the spanish that's an interesting comment i'd like you to comment on that it would be amazing to have people appear from nowhere well do they really appear from nowhere and they show reverence to cartier so we got a lot of questions there yeah so i think uh, how would you respond to that yeah what we need to do is try to put together this this so they're very touchy with them and they clearly want this relationship as people said early on with them and reverence, I think, maybe even so, you know, something like that is going on. But I don't think they think they're gods. I think they think they have some kind of power, though. And this is would be a good plant, place to explain to students that most Native North Americans were inclusivist. And I think we talked about this a little bit in the last seminar for those who were part of it. But basically, that unlike Christianity and Islam and Judaism, which are exclusivist, you if you convert to that religion, you're supposed to be completely that and get rid of your old beliefs and practices, at least in theory. Native American religions were inclusivist. You could add on new, powerful, interesting beliefs and practices to your own. And so sometimes I think we over dichotomize sort of thinking that Europeans are gods versus not thinking that. Most Native North Americans in this era believe that foreigners could bring spiritual power and spiritual learning and information that they didn't that the people didn't already have and that was I think that's one of the things they're trying to get from Cartier and I'll also tell you that in the next bit right after this that I didn't put up here um, they, so they they start to bring some of their sick to him uh, and, to, and, and, and try to get sort of blessings or healing on their sick. So I think they, they've probably been experiencing some diseases that the Europeans have brought um, and think maybe the Europeans can help them heal them. Well that raises an interesting question. Michael Vernon here writes, did the first voyage interact with this specific group or is Cartier just assuming the hearty welcome is customary in their country? Um, the, so these, they did not, yeah, they did not interact with these particular people that were, in the next slide we'll, we'll see the Staticonans whom they did uh, interact with quite a bit. Um, but uh, this hearty welcome is actually something that Cartier and the French get over and over, just about everywhere they go. Um, although the Staticonans were actually, uh, um, when they met them the very first time, they did not help, they did not, uh, they were not quite as excited to meet them, so um, it, it's not universal. Right. Well, in, in last week's webinar, you pointed out that often uh, what we think of as first contacts really weren't first contacts, that they had seen uh, European, Native Americans had seen European slave ships off their coast. They had heard about uh, other uh, Native American contacts with Europeans through the sort of uh, trading routes and so forth. Uh, right. So was, was Cartier, was this really a first encounter or... Had well, they've, uh, they've almost news of certainly Europeans heard. Proceeded. Yeah, they've definitely had news of Europeans. They've probably gotten some goods that have come from Europe through other uh, Indians. Um, mm -hmm. This far up the St. Lawrence, they may not have seen Europeans before, and there have been French uh, fishing boats in this region since probably before Columbus. Um, but they um, probably didn't go up the St. They wouldn't have gone this far up the St. Lawrence. Mm -hmm. So Merrill writes, so maybe they regarded Cartier and his crew as medicine men or magicians. Yeah, yeah, as I think foreigners often could be, you know, uh, who might bring strange powers, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, well, shall we move ahead then? Yeah, sure. So um, so next, uh, Cartier goes back down the St. Lawrence uh, at, to meet with uh, Staticonans, who I said are also an Iroquoian people, but not of the Iroquois Confederacy. And they include the, the chief, Donacona, and his sons. Now, his sons actually were with Cartier on his voyage back to France. So, so Staticona, chief Donacona, 
his sons have been to France with Cartier and came back. And now, at this point, the slide we're about to get to, they've gone back to their village, met with their father, and now Cartier's coming back down the river to meet with their father as well. So who knows what they have said to their people about France. Donnacona showed the captain the scalps of five men stretched on hoops like parchment and told us they were Tudamans uh, from the and south. That's probably Mohawk or other people of the Iroquois Confederacy. Okay. Who waged war continually against his people. <clears throat> he informed us also that two years previously, these Tudacamans had come and attacked them in that very river on an island which lies opposite the Sanguine River, where they were spending the night on their way to Huandego, being on the warpath against the Tumadanans. Uh, with some 200 men, women, and children who were surprised when asleep in a fort they had thrown up, to which the two Madonnans set fire roundabout and slew them as they rushed out, except five who made their escape. Of this defeat, they still continued to complain bitterly, making clear to us that they would have vengeance for the same. So what, what, is, Donacana, what is Chief Donacana trying to do in this excerpt, do you think? What is, what is Cartier okay. hearing? What is Chief Donacana trying to do? He's trolling for allies. Hey, that's a good verb, trolling for allies. I like that. Yeah. What else? We've got some other attendees typing, trying to gain French as allies. Donacona is is warning Cartier. That's, that's an interesting uh, take I on this. You about dangerous people, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Expressing that he is... Not a pushover. Yeah, that's another another interesting spin. Um, and, and yeah, that may Sharon, that may be coming partly from this whatever his sons have told him about France himself it, itself. They suddenly these are people. The Staticonans are people who have a very different. I, so we, we've been looking at people who just see the French arrive in ships, right? And they it's all men. They don't know what who these people are, what they want. They're kind of strange and maybe maybe have some strange spiritual powers. But Donacon is sons have been to France, and they can tell about Paris and about um, uh, who knows what. We have a question uh, about the introduction of the Jesuits. When, when did the Jesuits figure into all of this, Kathleen? They're going to come a bit later. Mm -hmm. um, so, so they'll follow on the heels of, of Cartier and, um, and the explorations, and they'll, they'll, they'll come ar around the same time that Champlain does and, and officially um, founds Quebec. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And obviously, and, yes, have a huge, huge role in the in the history of New France. And uh, Mary is doing some really close reading here. What about the presentation of scalps as a tactic to impress? Ah, yeah. So um, <laughs> you can imagine what Cartier thinks when he sees these scalps. He says it here as if it's no big deal, but it's not. Scalping is not a practice, and you know, Europeans were plenty uh, brutal and bloody in many ways, but they hadn't invented scalping. Um, so. Seeing the scalps of, of people stretched on hoops like parchment would be a pretty impressive sight. Mm -hmm. And a gross and, um, one. <laughs> yeah, pro yeah, probably so. <laughs> they're uh, probably dried, you know, yeah, not, yeah. not too well, gross. The ones anymore. I've seen, you know, they're there. <laughs> anyway, well, we lost. Um, I was going to bring Amelia's comment into the conversation here, and it's sort of there we go. They may also be hoping that Cartier will offer to take care of the problem for them to open up trade. How much yes. was trade on them? Yeah, mind? I think that's exactly right. That um, that they know Cartier wants trade. They want trade with Cartier, maybe weapons from Cartier, um, and that that will be a very good. Uh, but both of those things, the French helping and the French weapons, will be important for defeating their enemies. Right, and Michael writes this seems similar to the passage last week. When the Tlaxcalans, uh, I can't pronounce that, were asking for aid from Cortez, Donacona portrays the Tumidans as warlike and vindictive. Yeah, that 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 does suggest what some of the right. some of the passages we read last week. He tells the story of yeah yeah um, that uh, they surprise us in our in the in our sleep. They uh, set fire. They they killed us as we rushed out. So it's just terrible you know, these are terrible people of course you would be on our side because they're uh, um, you know they're barbarians right mm -hmm. let me ask a question about the document itself now the um, 
uh, Columbus letters, I mean, it was pretty clear that Columbus was trying to curry favor with the crown in, in Spain. Uh, we saw that he, he's promising them the sun, the moon, and the stars, um, and, and take, telling them it's going to be an easy, easy conquest. Why is Cartier writing this account? And, and so, what's his audience? Yeah. So the, the audience is definitely the king. Um, so in some ways it's very similar. And the idea is to find a place that will be profitable. Um, but at the same time, Columbus was, because he was the first, he was going out and uh, had to really persuade Ferdinand and Isabella that this was worth any time at all. Whereas mm -hmm. Cartier is a little bit more of the almost the employee, he's, he's hired to go out there and, and do this exploring, and, um, and I feel like in some ways he's not quite as, um, as propagandistic. He's not quite as determined to convince the king. And then again, this is also written by, uh, you know, compiled by somebody else, um, and there's just a little bit more of a sense that they're trying to get across who these different people are, what kind of relationships there might be, um, and, uh, and what good it can do the crown, but in a, a little bit more detailed sort of way. Uh, um, I think they're trying to mm -hmm. get it right also. Yeah. And Merrill writes, the French seem much more matter-of-fact than Columbus. Could you comment on the difference between um, Spanish colonization and French colonization? So I think, you know, the first thing I would say is, is it's a little dangerous ever to generalize between the two, and we just got our two explorers here. But... It, the, and also, you know, the French are going to end up in New France, or in, you know, in this northern part of North America, where they're going to have to, trade is going to be a larger part of what they do, rather than the kind of um, sort of setting themselves up on top of and conquering Native peoples and enslaving Native peoples the way the Spanish do. And, and, and some of that it's just because the Sp Spanish find places that have gold mines, they find places that have silver mines, and they find in Mexico this, this society that they're able to topple with the help of, of, of Native people who'd been um, subjected to them and um, sort of reap benefits from the top. And the French have to kind of go in a little bit more at the, bo <laughs> the bottom and, mm -hmm. and uh, form these relationships like they're trying to do here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, uh, excuse me, go ahead. And, and so I think Meryl points out that they're much less condescending, and, and I think um, part of that is just that they, uh, um, it's a different kind of relationship they're building. Mm -hmm. And you, you alluded to something uh, just a moment ago, the difference between the products. I mean, the Spanish were getting gold and silver, the French were getting beaver pelts. Uh, was that primarily had... what they were getting? Yeah, the French would have loved to have gotten gold and silver, <laughs> but uh, but there wasn't any up there, so it, it does become mostly the beaver trade. Yeah, and they could not control the, the Native Americans as they went out into the woods to catch the beavers, whereas if you're mining, that's a concentrated effort. You've got a, a workforce in one place. You can control them more easily. That's exactly right, yeah. yeah. And here we have <clears throat> some comments. Um, Columbus's account is much more romantic, uh, Cartier doesn't seem to try to appeal to the moral conflict of taking advantage of the natives. Interesting point. Mary writes, the Cour des Bois are not interested in conquest and take on their ways. Andrea writes, my impression is that the early Spanish explorers were much more brutal to indigenous populations. Is that true? Mining is more suited to slave labor, as we just commented. So how would you respond to those comments? Um, so I think, yeah. Go ahead. Um, the question about brutality, I, I think... Um, on the one hand, yes, the Spanish explorers were more brutal to indigenous populations, um, but it's not completely clear that if uh, if positions had been shifted, the French couldn't have been as well if they'd found themselves in places with with the kind of mining opportunities that the Spanish did on their very first places that they went on Hispaniola and the other colonies. Um, so, so yeah, to Andre's question, both uh, um, to Andre's question, both the Spanish and the French were interested in converting the indigenous population and put a huge amount of effort, both of them, into uh, um, into sending Catholic priests, both Franciscans and, and Jesuits, as well as some others. Um, but the practicality was that the French really did end up having 
not in the West Indies, but in New France and Louisiana, having um, relationships with Native Americans that were much more on a trade basis, um, which was closer to a, a position of equality. Mm -hmm. And Andre yes, Merrill points out that, that that was my 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 quick but uh, but very important exception of, of French certain French brutality, French slavery, um, French plantation owning in the West Indies, including Saint Domingue. Mm -hmm. Right, but that comes that comes much later, and of course, that you, that's all caught up with a uh, um, more racial um, uh, con a more racial context than uh, than this. Would you say? Um, right. Although I'd say it's probably just more the the timing of it. It's uh, by then it's yeah, it's plantations. They've begun to bring in African slaves, um, mm -hmm. having mostly killed off or run off uh, the native populations of the islands. Um, so, but it is a, a good example of uh, you know, a good warning to not romanticize the French and think that they're so, somehow naturally less brutal in this period than the Spanish. Right. And Andrea notes that, uh, of course, both the Spanish and the French were converting these natives to Catholicism. Um, was there was there a different? Did Catholic, did Spanish Catholicism differ in tone from French Catholicism? French Catholicism always seemed to be to be more. Syncretic, the more more accepting of uh, of native views, whereas Spanish Catholicism was more intolerant. Is that fair to say? I think it's. I mean, it, it's true um, in general, but I think it's more a distinction between uh, Franciscans and Jesuits. I think uh, Jesuits ah. in general were um, more easily persuaded to, that inclusivism was not terrible. That mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, there the. The Spanish priests in New Mexico and other places uh, just got extremely angry and violent when they found uh, Indians still practicing their old, you know, their their former non-Christian practices. Whereas in general, it's not always true, but in general, mm -hmm. the Jesuits um, saw it as a longer-term goal of complete conversion. With some, mm -hmm. um, uh, Andrea writes, Franciscans were in Spain, the Jesuits were French. Is that uh, fair? Right. Most. So, in the colonies, in general, more often Franciscans were in the Spanish Empire and Jesuits were in the French Empire. But but there were lots and lots of Jesuits in the Spanish Empire as well. So it's not but it's not completely right. And then within each order, there was a mix of Europeans. So you might have a, a French Jesuit mission in New France, but it would have Jesuits from from other parts of Europe as well. Okay. But yeah, well, yeah for the most part, I think be, especially the second part, that, that most, I believe it's fair to say that most French missionaries were just, you know, most, most missionaries in the French colonies were Jesuit. The, the Spanish Empire was just so gigantic, it's hard to even generalize about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, here Andrea points out that in New Orleans, many of the Catholic schools are Jesuits, so, yeah. but New Orleans was, was both Spanish and French, I mean, it, it passed, <laughs> right. uh, passed hands uh, quite often, you oh. know. <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, um, if we want to just sort of uh, finish up here, how, how do you think Cartier is going to react to this proposal? Okay, another discussion question. How is Cartier going to re react? Is he going to uh, ally himself or uh, step back? We have some responses coming in, uh, several responses. Yeah, he's probably, you know, thinking about those scalps. All right, all right, we have the Jesuits. We're still talking about the Jesuits. They built many schools. Um, they were uh, a bit of the, bit off, sorry, the Portuguese Jesuits were in Japan at the time. Well, they were all over the place. Okay, okay, now Mary writes, in, our, in response to our question about how Cartier is going to respond, depends on what his goals were at the time. Yeah, that's good. Good, good. So, Dropping it into context. And my impression is that the early Spanish explorers... Okay, oh, that's um, slipped up there. Okay. I can't imagine after coming all that way, Cartier was going to pull back. That's right. So Cartier and the, and the French end up getting pulled into this war, um, which, uh, unfortunately for them, is against the Iroquois Confederacy, which is, uh, was not so great for the French. So the French get pulled into decades of war uh, on the side of these Iroquoians and the Hurons and, and Algonquins in the region fighting against the Iroquois Confederacy. The Iroquois Confederacy, in turn, uh, pulls in first the Dutch and then the English. And so this becomes a a war that's both a, you know, an intra-Indian war and an intra-European war. 
Yeah, these were, it was ama it's amazing to me the way the colonial wars um, become uh, really global wars. I mean, these right. are, yeah. you know, these are, are European uh, battles being fought on North American soil. That's right. And this is one that arguably was actually started by a pre-existing native war um, that oh. got Europeans involved in it and then spread even more to, uh, uh, you know, to Europe and other parts of the globe as well. Yeah, so, all those colonies. Here we have some comments. It was good for the British, however, that the French became the enemies of the yes. Iroquois Confederacy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The New World <laughs> drama, it really. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Although that later on posed some problems for the newly minted United States because they were trying to get the Iroquois Confederacy to calm down and, and give up their British allegiances. Right, uh, right. <clears throat> yeah, and if uh, let me just put in another plug for our America in Class lessons. We just this week uh, posted two new lessons on um, relations between the new United States and Native Americans in the North and in the South. They're really good lessons and uh, they talk about these all of these problems that the newly minted United States faced with these foreign nations right there on their western border and in right. some cases in, uh, in Georgia, uh, mm -hmm. western Georgia. So it uh, sounds like a middle school cat fight. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> with scalps. <laughs> with scalps, yeah. That's, thank God they don't scalp people in middle school. They have a lot of bald kids running around. All right, well, well, shall we move ahead? Let's move on back to the Spanish um, in North America. So um, after Cortez um, and discovered the Aztec Empire uh, for Europeans and uh, put himself on top to conquer the Aztecs with, a, um, with the help of his allies. After Pizarro then um, discovered the Inca Empire for Europeans and um, uh, inserted himself in, into all of that, um, the Spanish decided that what they needed to do next was find another great Aztec Empire or Incan Empire. And they spent the rest of the 16th century looking for more of those places, including looking north of Mexico, where, of course, they wouldn't find them. Um, Cabeza de Vaca um, and two other Spaniards and uh, their black slave, Esteban, were shipwrecked off the coast of Florida in 1528 and, um, as many of you know, ended up sort of walking across, uh, you know, sort of rafting and then walking across Texas and back to Mexico eventually for se over several years. And so Cabeza de Vaca is particularly is important for many reasons, but including that he came back, he came to, back to the Spanish, opposed to slave raiding, opposed to exploiting Indians, really wanting to establish the kind of relationship we were just talking about as sort of the ideal, the trading relationship that some French at least established with some Native Americans of, of a more equal, but equally pro but profitable for both sides sort of relationship. But one of the things that Cabeza de Vaca did as he was telling the tale was he mentioned that he'd heard about some cities and he's probably talking about he, he hadn't seen them himself but he would heard rumors of them and they were probably of the mississippian city-states um, or perhaps of the pueblos and uh, so many of the spanish listeners who heard cabeza de vaca's tale sort of didn't really listen to what he said about mm, don't raid for slaves don't exploit indians and and what they really heard was the rumor of cities and so that rumor, Cabeza de Vaca's rumor of cities to the north, would bring more conquistadors to the north, including Francisco de Coronado, who came to the Pueblos up from Mexico, and who we'll be talking about here, Hernando de Soto, who landed at Tampa Bay. Um, now, de Soto would find cities. He would find the great Mississippian cities uh, of the American Southwest. There were thousands of city-states uh, that had uh, begun to arise probably about 700 A.D., they were built on good agricultural land uh, on the on the rivers of the Mississippi Basin. Um, there was a lot of diversity within these Mississippian city-states. Some had hundreds of people, some had thousands, even tens of thousands of people. Um, they had varying political structures. Some were ruled by a council of representatives or elders, but many of them were extremely centralized monarchies. Um, archaeologists have found burials within the mounds that they built uh, filled with goods and people, including people who were clearly killed to be buried along with a monarch. Um, you can see on the map here, DeSoto landed at Tampa Bay, sort of walked up through Florida, up in, 
across Georgia into the Carolinas, back down into Alabama, across Mississippi, and eventually across uh, the Mississippi, um, as, uh, and into Texas, Arkansas and Texas. And over and over, uh, as he would meet people, they would say, you know, he would try to get them to have gold. He actually, he had a string of interpreters. They would say, we don't have gold, but you know, my neighbor, a couple of days journey, that direction does. And they just sort of kept him walking across, uh, usually trying to get rid of him and his army, keep them going on their way. Um, sometimes they would even send him to their enemy to try to you know, sort of get him to fight their enemy in sort of the same way that we saw just now, but usually they wouldn't go with him. They'd just send him off and hope that he wouldn't come back. Um, there's a lot of wonderful material in the DeSoto accounts, but I've just chosen two for us to, to talk about. Um, so let's just move us to the first of these slides, if Richard will read it. Uh, and Merrill mentions Cahokia, yes. So Cahokia was, was the, the largest of the Mississippian cities, perhaps as many as 40,000 people. Um, the most populous city north of Mexico until Philadelphia passed it uh, late in the 1700s. Okay. But here we're at. In this, we're, uh, we're in uh, toward the beginning of DeSoto's journey. He's sort of by this point in kind of north central Florida, what's, what's now the state of Florida. Malapaz was so called because one representing himself to be its cacique came peacefully saying that he wished to serve DeSoto with his people and asked that he would order the 28 men and women prisoners taken the night before to be freed, that provisions should be brought, and that he would furnish a guide for the country in advance of us. Whereupon the governor, having ordered the prisoners to be set free and the Indian put under guard. The next day in the morning came many natives close to a scrub surrounding the town near which the prisoner asked to be taken that he might speak and satisfy them, as they would obey in whatever he commanded. But no sooner had he found himself close to them than he boldly ran away and fled so swiftly that no one could overtake him, going off with the rest into the woods. So here he's, uh, this, this chief has come, this cacique has come, and he... Um, Promises all these things, get the prisoners freed, and then runs away, right? Yeah, Malapasa, bad place. I think maybe bad peace, like like he, somebody who comes and makes peace and then does uh, uh, goes back on it. Okay, it says, interesting if you describe the name Malapasa, bad location. Okay, another comment on that. Okay, shall we... <clears throat> Go to our questions here, Kathleen. Yeah, great. Okay, what happened in Malapaz? What's going on here? Do we have any any uh, takers on that question? Number of people are typing. Um, it's interesting the the way the uh, sounded like a bait and switch. Yeah, that's exactly right. He's, uh, mm -hmm. Um, it sounds like it's good, and, and this is what DeSoto needs. He desperately needs people to help him, um, and so he, he um, falls for it, I think. Mm -hmm. But why does he take the, uh, the uh, cacique uh, captor? I mean, captive. I mean, he's the guy's offering help, and then he uh, arrests him. I mean, does that, uh, DeSoto wasn't much of a diplomat. No, well, he's he's you know he he comes in with a huge army and he's um, he's just he, he's but he doesn't know what he's doing he doesn't know what's going on any place and that really makes him desperate and fairly brutal um, so he puts the uh, he puts the cacique under guard which you know he set the prisoners free but then he puts the cacique under guard I think he probably thinks of that as not that big a deal he's he's already agreed to let the, the prisoners free. Mm -hmm. um, but that may be the point at which the cacique decides, this is crazy, we're going to all get out of here, we're not going to do any of the things we've promised. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we are of our second discussion question, what news of DeSoto spread, do you think? All right, looks like he was trying to trick DeSoto for his people. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think if you think about the perspective, I mean, here comes this, army at this point this is fairly early there's still probably several hundred a couple hundred uh, soldiers in this army they've got this shiny metal they've got horses they've got mastiffs this is uh, you know they've got swords they've got these uh um, these crazy guns that aren't very accurate and are extremely hard to reload but are but are kind of explosive um, 
-hmm. One of the things that struck me about last week's seminar and this week too is the um, diplomatic sophistication of the Native Americans. I think we we may have a kind of noble savage image of them or a kind of um, naive image of them the way <clears throat> Columbus described them, but in these uh, in this one particularly, and in other things that we've seen, they, they you know, Native American, Native Americans, they, they were quite accustomed to this sort of thing, wheeling and dealing, and yeah, and, and the, the fainting and and bobbing and weaving of diplomacy because they'd been doing it with their own people for what centuries. I mean, this that's right. Yeah, they weren't innocents when the uh, when the uh, Europeans arrived. Right. And we have some other comments here. Um, it's also reminiscent of the European tendency to maintain guests as hostages. Yeah, news, of DeSoto probably yeah. news of DeSoto probably showed the native people. Um, I lost that for a moment. Where did it go? To, oh, to stay know. clear of Spanish explorers. That's right. So we're, we were talking earlier about news spreading. And you know the news of this crazy army spread fast. Now, um, it was... Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it would spread through trading paths. Right, exactly. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, Mary writes, are these tribute-based Are these tribute based societies? Yeah, it's pretty clear that they are. Um, I mean, it's hard to reconstruct completely, but, but there are many times in DeSoto's accounts, and there's other evidence that there would be, you know, maybe uh, you know, one chiefdom that would be, over several other chiefdoms that each would have their own cacique, but the lower ones would owe tribute up to the um, to the main chiefdom. Mm -hmm. And we saw that last week with the uh, uh, Indians in Virginia. I mean, Poetan's right. uh, kingdom was arranged that way. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Marilyn Pat have a, sort of figured out why he's under guard. You just um, uh, that they're. Um, thinking of him as a hostage, but I, I think maybe not quite in the way we would think of it as that um, that that's what you do when you're when somebody's given when somebody in this strange place has made promises to you, you sort of keep him under guard. Now, whether um, the cacique interpreted that way or not is quite a different question. I think as somebody else, somebody earlier said in the comments, he probably thought that was quite not the way you treat a diplomat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He he wasn't familiar with these European ways. Right. Yeah. Can't blame him. Right. Well, shall we move ahead to see what happens to DeSoto? Yeah, so, so DeSoto keeps going. Um, the next slide is going to have him all the way on the other side of the Mississippi. Um, I forget exactly how long, but a couple of years later, or, you know, at least many, many months later. Um, and he, at this point, the, the Spanish, Spanish have become completely desperate. And there are many, many fewer of them. They've had to abandon much of their armor and weaponry along the way. So they're looking pretty different at this point than they did at the beginning. The governor sank into a deep despondency at sight of the difficulties that presented themselves to his reaching the sea. And what was worse, from the way in which the men and horses were diminishing in numbers, he could not sustain himself in the country without help. He sent a messenger to the cacique of Quiglatam to, to say that he was the child of the sun, and from where he came all obeyed him, offering their tribute that he besought him to value his friendship and to come where he was, that he would be rejoiced to see him, and in token of love and his obedience he must bring him something from his country that was in most esteem there. By the same Indian the chief returned this answer. As to what you say of your being the son of the sun, if you will cause him to dry up the great river, I will believe you. As to the rest, it is not my custom to visit anyone, but rather all of whom I have ever heard have come to visit me, to serve and obey me, and pay me tribute either voluntarily or by force. If you desire to see me, come where I am. If for peace, I will receive you with special goodwill. If for war, I will await you in my town, but neither for you nor for any man will I set back one foot. So what is each man trying to convey to the other, and which do you think was more persuasive and why? Okay. What are they trying to do each other, do, do, do for each other here? What, are they, what, are they, what signals are they sending? Power struggle. There we go. <clears throat> was the power of struggle. 
Um, do you, at, at this point, do you think, Kathleen, uh, I think the chief was more persuasive. <laughs> uh, I think he was too. I think most people would agree. Kathleen, at this point, do you think the cacique has has heard of DeSoto? Has DeSoto's Yeah, uh, he has not weakness? only heard of DeSoto, uh, yeah, but he has, uh, DeSoto even knows that this chief has sent diplomats to, so, so at this point, DeSoto and his men are staying in one chiefdom. Uh, on the other on the on the west side of the Mississippi, and uh, Qu Qu Quigaltum is on the eastern side of the Mississippi. And he, DeSoto knows that Quigaltum has sent uh, diplomats to talk not to DeSoto but to his hosts in this Mississippian town. Uh, and DeSoto knows they must be talking about DeSoto and what to do about him. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, this this chief knows a lot about the Spanish and the state of them at that point and their demands. Mm -hmm. Jennifer writes, he was in full survival mode, telling the cacique of Quiglatam that he was a child of the sun and all obeyed him. However, the chief was like, prove it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think what? this is... This is the kind. This is an exchange that students of almost any age, I think, can get their teeth into because yeah. of that. Like, prove it. Yes, yes. <laughs> well put. Well put, there, Jennifer. Um, the chief does not seem impressed by Desoto rattling metaphorical swords. Also, the diseases the Europeans were bringing to the Native American was well known. So, why would a Native American seek a European out? Is that the case? To the do the, at this point, do the Native Americans associate those diseases with the Europeans? I think it's, I think at this place and this time, probably not. Because, I mean, it, sort of disease, histor historians who look at disease debate a lot about whether DeSoto and his men could have brought diseases this far into the interior with them, or if anybody, um, you know, who, and then it has to do with, you know, looking at each disease and seeing what the, um, uh, the incubation period would have been, and all those sorts of things. And a lot of people say that they they probably weren't bringing diseases with them at, at this point, this far into mm -hmm. the interior. Um, mm -hmm. But we know in the wake of disease, uh, with the wake of DeSoto, diseases will spread through, probably mostly through native trading networks and explorers who come to the coast. Um, so I, I suspect this chief wouldn't have associated disease with DeSoto. Well, again, let me ask about this document. Who was its audience and what was its purpose? So this is, there. we have four different accounts that were written out of the DeSoto expedition by different people, some of whom were there, some of whom weren't there, but took testimony from other people. Um, so this was, it was by this point, unlike with Columbus and even unlike with Cartier, by this point, there's a huge market in Europe of readers who want to learn about this new world. And so some of the purpose, a lot of the purpose of writing this is actually to publish it and get it out to those people. Um, so a good story is really important. But this mm -hmm. is, they also know that it's being written by multiple people, so they're going to try to get it you know, not completely wrong because they know they're gonna, um, people will read more than one account of this which I think helps with its accuracy. On the other hand, um, most they're writing maybe from notes um, and a lot from memory. So, um, you know, these direct quotations, that, that's, that's not, quite, it's not quite right. This is not quite a direct quotation. Right. Well, who, who wrote this? Is this DeSoto writing this? Or who's, no, this who's is writing actually this? a gentleman of Elvis um, who was, a, 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 I think he's a Portuguese... Um, member of the expedition who says he compiles uh, different accounts and puts them together into this one. So he was a member of the expedition. I think Elvis is. I should double yeah, check yeah. myself. Yeah. So he's this is this he's uh, he's not um, uh, inflating the reputation of DeSoto here. I mean, this is really a, a put down of DeSoto, as so many of our participants have said. Chanel writes, DeSoto's invitation is pretty desperate. The cacique is no fool. He proved his disdain for DeSoto. Chief seems, uh, Allison writes, Chief seems more grounded and convincing. He is much more aware of the two-faced nature of the Europeans as DeSoto would have liked. And then the chief has no need from his own perspective for a relationship with DeSoto. He knows DeSoto wants more from him than he wants in return. Therefore, right. let DeSoto take yeah. the secondary role. Yeah, so, so perhaps, uh, so if we think of the, um, the Iroquoians whom Cartier met as, you know, 
know, maybe wanting as much from Cartier as Cartier wanted from them. They both, both sides want trade. You're exactly right. In this point, this cacique knows that DeSoto needs lots of things, including food, um, and has nothing to offer. Um, mm-hmm. And I just, I, I did, I checked my, uh, checked my information, and yeah, the gentleman of Elvis, so the author of this, was an officer who was there with DeSoto, so he was on mm-hmm. the expedition. What did this do to DeSoto's reputation in Europe? Um, so DeSoto, by this point, was dead. Oh, well, <laughs> so, there you go. It doesn't really matter, does it? <laughs> right, he dies just a couple days after this. And so some of the motive behind these writings was to explain why this expedition was such a failure. Uh-huh. And I think the general, if you had to generalize from all the accounts of it, the fa- it's a failure because they just go from city to city without, uh, these are places that don't have gold but are very, very powerful, which is a bad combination for Europeans, what Europeans want. Right, right. And we have a question, how did DeSoto die? Oh, it's wonderful. So he's in this town, this, this town he's in during this uh, this encounter. Um, he just dies of, well, we don't even know what it, a broken heart, maybe. <laughs> they, don't, they don't know what he dies of, but uh, his men, they've, at this point, they've been, they've been trying to convince the Indians around that DeSoto is a god. So they're trying to use that to their advantage. The Indians probably don't think that, but they keep building him up as being all powerful. So when he suddenly dies, um, they decide to keep his death a secret. So they sneak out of the gate. It's it's a walled city, um, this Mississippian city-state. They sneak out of the walls of the city. Uh, They bury him real fast. You can imagine they buried him probably fairly badly since they were trying to do it in secretly and quickly. They go back into the the city. Um, And then the next day, they see some of the Indians of this, uh, uh, some of the Mississippians out there sort of looking around where they buried him, like, and, and also others are starting to ask where DeSoto is because they haven't seen him in a little while. Um, and so <laughs> you know they're being watched, but the next night uh, the Spanish creep back out of the city, they dig up the body, they put him in a canoe and dump his body in the Mississippi. Mm-hmm. It's just a, it's just a uh, disaster from start to finish. Well, uh, why don't we move ahead? Uh, we're, we've got about 13 minutes to go. Okay, great. So, uh, um, so DeSoto dies. The rest of the men go fleeing down the Mississippi. Only a few of them survive to tell the tale. Um, and then Coronado's mission that goes at exactly the same time, look, also looking for the, these northern cities of gold, goes up into the Pueblos, crosses the plains, and it's a total disaster, too, and very similar to DeSoto in its... Uh, and the reasons why it's a disaster. They find nothing, and they don't, uh, uh, they, they find no riches. Um, they only find a lot of really powerful Indians. So by, 17, by, by 1565, Spain still claimed all of North America, but really had very little interest in it. So that's um, one of the reasons that they, that um, Cartier's exploration and the follow-up on that can happen. Um, also, the French crown in the 1560s, decided to make a more bold attempt at North America, and that was to try to colonize a little bit of the land that the Spanish called Florida. Um, so um, the, at the time, of course, uh, as you know, European history, as I'm sure you all do, the, the France was having religious wars between its Huguenots, its Protestants, um, and Catholics. And so the idea in the 1560s was that Huguenots would make the perfect colonists, send some of them off, get them out of France, um, and let them then represent France in this dangerous place that Spain has claimed and Indians live in. Um, So in 1562, a Frenchman named Jean Ribot led an exploration of Florida, um, first around what's now the northeastern border of Florida, so the Atlantic coast of of, uh, of the border between Florida and South Carolina. And there, uh, Jean Rebeau planted a, or erected a stone column, which unfortunately I cut off of this picture. I, mean, I hope you get a chance to look for this picture later. If you just search uh, Jean Rebeau, you can find it. Um, but uh, there's a, a stone column that he set up, to that, uh, and the purpose was to claim the region for France, although, of course, Spain thought that was ridiculous. Um, and he met this chief named Chief Satorion. 
Um, but then he kept sailing north, Jean Robo kept sailing north, and founded a colony on Paris Island, South Carolina. Um, then he and his ships went back to France for more supplies and more settlers, intending to, to beef up this settlement. Um, but war, religious wars that were continuing in France, delayed him for two years. And in fact, Rabot ended up in prison for part of that time. In the meantime, the 27 or so men that he left on Paris Island in this new French colony um, were hungry. They ran out of food. They ran out of supplies. They felt abandoned when the ships didn't return. Uh, they mutinied at one point against their leader. Um, and they started complaining to their Indian neighbors that they'd been left behind. And the Indians felt sorry for them and actually helped them build a sort of boat raft with a sail to uh, to go home to France and they actually made it they actually sailed back to France on this homemade boat um, along the way they had to uh, drink their own urine and eat their shoes and eat one of their comrades um, but uh, but they made it back to France going in the other direction across the Atlantic at almost the same time that these desperate men were were returning to France um, in 1564 a Frenchman named René Laudonnier was sent by Rabot um, back to the site at the northeastern border of Florida is where he ended up. And there he established Fort Caroline in the name of the French. Um, so this is a French colony in the 1560s in what the Spanish considered to be Spanish Florida um, and what is actually the land of uh, the Timucuans and other Indians of, uh, of Florida. Okay, <clears throat> let's put this one on the table. Then the chief suggested going to see the stone column that we had erected during the voyage of Jean Riveau. It was a thing to which they ascribed great significance. Having granted their request to go to the place where the stone was set up, we found it to be crowned with magnolia garlands, and at its foot there were little baskets of corn. They kissed the stone on their arrival with great reverence and asked us to do the same. As a matter of friendship, we could not refuse. And when this was done, the chief took me by the hand, as if he had a great secret to tell me, and showed me by signs how far up the river his dominion lay. He said that he was called King Saturiona. Satur Satur <clears throat> After I had spent a little time with him, the chief asked one of his sons to present a slab of silver to me, which he did willingly. As a reward, I gave a knife and some other more expensive presents, with which he seemed very well pleased. So what's, what's going on here between Laudonnier and Satoriona, who has met the French before? Okay, <clears throat> what's going so, on? So in, in general and often, the French crown didn't want non-Catholics to go to New France, but this, was, this colony was intended, sort of, and quite early colony, uh, so before the founding of Quebec and Montreal, was, uh, was intended to be a Huguenot colony. It was, I think it's, it was basically half Huguenot and half Catholic, or maybe a slightly more... Pro more than half Protestant, um, but this was to be, this was an exception. Okay, so what do we have here? Why is the chief uh, asking uh, the writer here to go to the memorial that they'd erected during the voyage for Jean Ribot? We have some people typing in. Let's see what uh, what answers we get. Maybe they thought that non-Catholics should be... Oh, okay, so that's the answer to another question. Um, yeah. He gives the French some... <laughs> yeah. It's uh, like putting them out uh, sort of as a barrier, a, a test case, if you will, against mm -hmm. see if the Spanish will attack and kill them, and if they don't, then maybe uh, <laughs> um, we can have a real colony there. He gives the French something that he knows will impress them, like many of the other stories he's making a good showing for his power. Yeah, that is one of the definite themes I think you could take away from these two seminars. Yeah, it's we see both sides trying to impress their power on the other one. I think that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, and then we could add to that if we're looking for other general themes, both sides often offering up what they have to give. So, especially if they're trying to establish trade um, or alliance, you know, this is what mm -hmm. I can give, and and this is what I want in return. Mm hmm. So, uh, so are the French. They're trying to uh, show their power. They grant the request, after all. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 The native and, and, and people. Actually, this, this column has a has a French uh, coat of arms on it too. So the French, at least, definitely see that as a sign of their power. 
<laughs> and the native people also received a knife. Usually the Europeans were reluctant to trade weapons. That's, That's right, and the native people are just as insistent that they do trade weapons. So it's a, <laughs> you're right, it's a, it's a constant struggle between the two. Yeah. <laughs> and then often the various crowns, and especially the French often will say, um, and the Spanish as well, we don't, we don't trade weapons, we do not give weapons, or we don't give guns to, to natives, and they just they very rarely can, can uh, keep that ban. Okay, so they, they, they had a, a sort of fr an early version of gun control in the United States. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Kelly writes, also having a son present the silver is another way of demonstrating the chief's power. What about that, Kathleen? Yeah, I think that's right. That's right. Oh, and that came up last time with the. I think that was with with Powhatan and getting some of the his courtiers to present things or accept things. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. your power and where did the silver come from? That's a good question. Where in Florida now? Where Where are they getting the silver? Yeah. So this may be one of those cases where the uh, um, the Europeans are discovering gold or silver that actually Europeans have brought. So this may be some silver that Satori Ona has from his earlier interaction with Rabo a couple years earlier, or from a shipwreck, or because um, some of the Spanish ships had had wrecked and um, that had been carrying silver. And I don't know how long, how far silver would get to the shore, but um, um, but uh, yeah, well, yeah, I don't think there's, I don't think they had silver. It, it also yeah, well, could have been copper. Yeah. Um, and you wonder uh, how much the, the natives in Florida would have valued silver because it wasn't there. Right. I mean, this, you know, um, it could have washed up because, because a lot of, obviously a lot of the Spanish treasure galleons sank off the coast of Florida. Yeah. Uh, and Mary points out that the silver may have been repurposed. Yes. Um, right. Right. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer writes, all I can think of is germs spreading with them, each <laughs> kissing the stone. <laughs> well, I guess well, they better... We better keep moving, huh? We're almost to our time. Yeah, and I've got one last question I want to pose to everybody before we wrap up tonight. So let's get on to Laudonniere's account. Yeah, Chief I, Setter. Sure, yeah. Yes, Maybe, Chief yeah, Setter. Yeah, yeah, sent several Indians to ask me if I would make good the promise that I had made when I first came to this country, that is to show myself to be a friend to his friends and to be an enemy to his enemies and also to accompany him with ample men with guns at the time when he thought it expedient and found occasion and opportunity to go to war. Yeah, so I, we probably don't need to take answers on this one because I think this is much the same as what we saw earlier with uh, the static Conans. That this is here at Satoriona saying, uh, you made a promise, you all are our allies, and as and he's set, trying to set the terms of the alliance. And I think if you, you know, if you go back to the full account, then you'll find Laudonnier giving his account, uh, like telling Satoriona what he thinks the terms of the alliance are. And so that might be another thing we, we could add, is both sides are trying to tell the other what their relationship should be like. Mm -hmm. And here, Jamie Beck writes, were the Magnolia Garlands sacred? Well, I mean, Rebo uh, I'm sorry, Lodonier certainly interprets them as that, and they look like it. And I'm sorry, we don't have that picture, but they you know, they look like something that's been being presented as um, a sacred. So, yeah, probably mm -hmm. so. At least and, in the big, you know, sort of big definition of that. And Pat Marshall makes an interesting comment. I have to keep reminding myself the accounts are written from a European perspective. I'm actually surprised at the amount of native scoring points on the Europeans that occurs in these excerpts. It really is, and it makes you think. I mean, I've thought about that a lot. Is there a reason why they would make that up? And I really, no, I don't think so. I think that it just happened a lot, and they were trying. These Europeans are really trying to understand a world that is completely strange to them, and so it's in their interest to get to, to get things down as they're said, I think, often. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our seminar, but I promised Jamie Beck that I would save her question here until the end, and I want to put it um, to Kathleen and to all of you. Jamie teaches second grade. Columbus Day is coming up. This refers back to what we, you know, our earlier uh, discussion about Columbus, and she asks, what should I tell my students about Columbus? Well, I hope some of the other teachers will write in now about what they think you should tell second graders, because I'm going to say for middle schoolers, high school students, and certainly for my own college students, I think Columbus's letter itself is a great way to get just get them in there. They can see both sides. They can understand Columbus in a way that's not hero worship, but also still gives him that voice. Maybe one idea I have with, with second graders, I've thought about 
the difficulties of teaching this kind of history to small children. I mean, it's so violent and horrible. I thought about it with my own children. It, one thing you might do is talk about Columbus Day and Indigenous Peoples Day, as some towns and some universities are, are changing it to, um, and really just talk about what it means to have a day that's called both of those things, or one or the other thing by different people. Or even, you know, if that's too complicated for second graders, I don't know if it is or not, just sort of talk about it as both that this is the day that Columbus, from his perspective, discovered the Americas. Um, that's not the, the day that celebrates that. Um, and it's also a day in which we talk about indigenous people and just explain what that means. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? That's, that's uh, see, Columbus had courage, but he did some bad things too. He did not treat Native Americans with proper respect. Um, <clears throat> love that idea. Perspective taking, in, take, perspective taking is big in the early days. That's good any, to hear. Yeah, I think that, that would be. Yeah. Would any be other comments? I think I think it is so important to introduce young children to uh, to history. But it, as Kathleen said, it is really difficult because, of course, history is uh, there's a lot of blood in history, and you certainly don't want to uh, to uh, to scare little children. I'm seeing that I have a, a five year old grandson who's now in kindergarten, and I know he's going to be studying these things, and he's going to be asking questions. Yeah. So. But yeah, maybe okay. some role playing of just you're Columbus, you're a Taino, and you're meeting for the first time. What do you say to each other? Mm. Yeah, yeah, that may be good. Uh, asking young children and focusing on on the, on the communications. What do you say to each other? All of the difficulty of misinterpretation. Uh, that might be a good role playing thing to do uh, to do in class, Jamie. I hope we've. I hope we've given you some ideas. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank all of you for your participation this evening and remind you to connect with America in class. We have a Facebook page. Please check that out and like us. We have those Pinterest. Go to our lessons. Uh, I think we have a lot there to offer you. Kathleen, I want to thank you for another excellent uh, seminar. I've learned a great deal, and I think our participants have too. Thank you very much. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, okay, ladies and gentlemen, our next webinar uh, will be on October 15th at 7 p.m. We're going to move ahead in American history, and we're going to be looking at Puritans in the New World. Again, th Kathleen, thank you very much. Thank you to our participants, and I hope we'll see you all next week. Good evening.